Thursday we're going to continue our study on the life of Elisha and look with me to 2 Kings chapter 4 uh, verses 1 through 7. Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. But the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what have you in the house? And she said, Your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, Go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels and not too few. Then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons and pour into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So she went to him and shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, Bring me another vessel. And he said to her, There is not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debts, and your, son, and your sons can live on the rest. Let us pray. Father, we see in this miracle your provision for a widow and her sons. We see the, your protection, your care, as well as your miraculous intervention. We also pray that we would think about the issue of, the, of those that are the helpless and those that uh, are the orphans, the fatherless, as we consider this passage. In Jesus' name, amen. In our text today, we see the story of the widow who was uh, the wife of one of the prophets. And she was going through a dire trial in her life. Her husband had died. She apparently had very few resources. Uh, J.C. Ryle made a good comment about trials and struggles in the believer's life. He said, trial, we must distinctly understand, is part of the diet which all true Christians must expect. It is one of the means by which their grace is proved and by which they find out what there is in themselves. Winter as well as summer, cold as well as heat, clouds as well as sunshine are all necessary to bring the fruit of the Spirit to ripeness and maturity. I think it's interesting to find out what is in themselves. It's often those times when there is a struggle or a trial that a true believer's heart is seen to be truly a believer and sometimes weaknesses, areas of fragility are seen as well. Well, this widow knew where to go to for help. She went to the prophet of God. Similar to Jehoshaphat in the previous story, she knew that her help had to come from God. And there are some important lessons for us in this narrative. First, we do see the miraculous intervention of God once again. And in it, the affirmation of Elisha's prophetic ministry. Second, we see instruction concerning the care of the widows. We're encouraged and motivated that way. Third, there are parallels between Elijah and Elisha, which point to John the Baptist and Jesus. First, we see that God supernaturally provides to the widow of one of his prophets. In verse 1, now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, but the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. This woman had probably lived a hard life because her husband had been in the prophetic ministry in northern Israel. He would have been one of the 7,000 in Israel who had not bowed the knee to Baal, remember that was said to Elijah in 1 Kings 19.18. Since he was a prophet, he had most likely lived through several waves of persecution from the wicked Queen Jezebel, 
He might have had to leave his family and go into hiding on more than one occasion. Perhaps he was among the hundred prophets whom Obadiah hid in caves and supplied with food and water. Remember in 1 Kings 18. In that environment of Israel, ruled by Ahab and Jezebel, it cost him dearly to follow the Lord faithfully. As a result, he would not have had hardly any assets to leave to his wife and family. The fact that he was married and had a family shows these individuals lived fairly normal lives in that regard. But now that he was dead, the debts had piled up, the creditor was banging at their door. The law of Moses provided that a creditor had the right to claim the person and children of the debtor who was unable to pay a debt. They were obliged to serve him, uh, indentured servanthood, until the year of Jubilee, or someone paid their debt. Leviticus 25 brings out that point. And she went to Elisha for help. It's interesting, the husband is described as, you know your servant feared the Lord. Uh, it's a nice way to be remembered. He wasn't just remembered as a nice man or a gifted teacher, or a devoted husband or father. He might have been all those things. He was particularly noted and remembered for leading a reverential life. And as we just mentioned, she knew where to turn in time of trouble. Uh, the story is told of a modern woman who was in debt and her pastor went to see her and she was outlining all her problems and the debtors and so on and the bills and he said, well, before we even talk about some practical things to do, why don't we pray together about this? And she sighed and said, oh, it's finally come to that. It was like prayer was the last resort. And it's finally come to the fact I have to pray for something. <laughs> well, often that's the way we think. We do everything we possibly can do, and then we think about praying. And of course, we need to pray and turn to God first, and, and certainly practical things can be done, but apparently this woman turned to God first. In verse 2, And Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me. What have you in the house? She said, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Now, the Hebrew word for oil, a souk, refers to the oil in an anointing flask, a, a small vessel for oil used to anoint the body. And we're not talking about a big jug of oil or even a, a bottle of oil like Crisco or something like that. It's not much oil. It really emphasizes the miracle that's about to take place. And we just read in the story that Elisha told her to go and have your sons gather up pots, vessels, some the neighbors, bring them to the house and shut the door, and then begin to pour the oil. Well, this woman acted in faith on the word of Elisha. It sounds like a strange thing to do. Go get a bunch of empty pots and pans and put them in the house. She and her sons gathered the empty containers and the neighbors. It was really a bold act of faith to start pouring the oil, trusting that God would fill the vessels. She trusted the word of God from Elisha, and she trusted God's providence and found him to be trustworthy. It was enough oil not only to pay her debts, but also to give her enough financial security for, for her and for her sons to live. Richard Patterson and Herman Ostell in their commentary observe, the command to fill the jars behind closed doors delivers the miracle from mere spectacle. It was a private need privately met by a sovereign and loving God. Philip Ryken states, because it was a private affair, the miracle of the joy, jars of oil is a story about a family learning of God's providence together. One of the very first spiritual lessons that children are able to learn is that they have a Heavenly Father who cares for them. The widow's sons learned this firsthand. 
They went around asking the neighbors of their empty jars and brought them to their mother one by one. Then they watched her fill them, every jar a lesson in the providence of God. Afterward, whenever the boys needed help in their daily necessities, they could look back to the miracle of the jar, jars of oil. Remember the time Mom asked us to uh, ask us get those pots and pans? We were about to be sold into slavery. <laughs> yeah, the other would say. It was, it was a miracle she never did. And remember when jo my Mom said, bring me another one. And there weren't any more. All of them were full. And they happily recounted this famous event in their family history. They would remember that God cares for the fatherless. It's a wonderful thing to trust God's providence as a family. I had very distinct memories as I was growing up. We had a prayer time in the mornings. And my father would pray before he would go off to his businesses. And I remember him praying each day that God would send the customers we need for our business to be sustained. And also pray that in the business, he said, that we would be able to serve them and meet the need they have in our particular area of, of, of business. Had furniture, appliances, electronics, and loan company, as well as selling groceries for many years. But there was a, a lesson in trusting God that was brought out almost every day in my early life. We also see the failure of Israel to care for a widow and the fatherless demonstrates the apostasy of that northern kingdom. Unlike the followers of Baal, the people of the true and living God were to care for the needy and the marginalized in their community. Perhaps even the creditors should have stepped in and tried to help them in some way. Uh, it was a widow and children of the deceased prophet of God. And God had established care for widows in the Mosaic Law and reiterates his concern in this in many places in Scripture. Here are just a few examples. Exodus 22, 22 to 24 says, you shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. And my wrath will burn and I will kill you with the sword. And your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. What a strong word. Deuteronomy 10, 17 and 18. For the Lord is God, the God of gods and Lord of lords the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and for the widow. And then look in Psalms, in Psalm 68. In Psalm 68, verses 5 and 6, really you pick up in verse 4, because it was a more complete idea. Sing to God, sing praises to His name, lift up a song to Him who rides through the deserts. His name is the Lord, exalt before Him, Father of the fatherless and protector of the widows is God in His holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home. He leads out, of, out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. And then in Psalm 146, verse 9, The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. 
In fact, the economic system of Israel was structured in such a way as to provide for the widow, the fatherless, the needy. I look back at Deuteronomy 14. Where we see this structure set forth briefly. In Deuteronomy 14, verses 19 through 21, I'm sorry, that's the wrong passage. Oh. Well, it's the pass. I was, thought I had the passage down where they don't glean the edges of the field so that the widow can come out and glean. You remember Ruth, the Moabite woman, when she was with Naomi back in Israel, would glean the, the fields. Um, so when Boaz took notice of her. But again, God provided for that type of idea. And repeatedly the prophets rebuked God's people for oppressing the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, and the poor. The first deacons in the church of Jerusalem were for the care of the widows. Remember there was a conflict between the, uh, the Jews in Jerusalem and the Hellenistic Jews. And they selected the seven men who would then distribute the charity. But again, caring for the widows. And James makes the point about true and undefiled religion being carried for the, the widows, the orphans. James 1.27 And the lack of this care in northern Israel during the days of Elisha is just one more evidence of the degree of the departure of God that existed in the land during that time. In the church, the care for a widow begins with her biological family. 1 Timothy 5.16 talks about families caring for those in their midst. Christian families should care for their widows. And if that avenue does not exist, Paul mentions older widows uh, who are active in the church in 1 Timothy 5. And the elders and deacons were to keep a list of those in this category and know their physical and spiritual needs to be providing for them. And you may remember in our recent series on 1 Timothy that we considered this idea carefully. However, it's not just the responsibility of church, leader, church leadership, but really a ministry of the whole church. And God is glorified when a local congregation cares for its widows and those in need in its church family. The passage we referred to a moment ago are not only mentioned widows, but also the fatherless. In one of Job's defenses against his tormenting friends, he mentioned that he cared for widows and took care of orphans, even on occasion raising them as his own children. In fact, look at Job 31. You always have to be careful in the book of Job to note who is speaking. Uh, the friends are not great avenues of truth. And... Uh, Job 31 and verses 17 to 23, Job is speaking. He's very 16. If I had withheld anything that the poor desired, or hath caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or have eaten my morsel alone, and the fatherless has not eaten of it, or from my youth the fatherless grew up with me as with a father, and from my mother's womb I guided the widow. You know, it's amazing statements. If I have seen anyone perish a lack of clothing or needy without covering, if his body has not, has not blessed me, and he is not warmed with the fleece of my sheep, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless because I saw my help in the gate, then let my shoulder blade fall from my shoulder, and let my arm be broken from its socket, for I was in terror of the calamity from God. I could not have faced his majesty. Job mentions, he said, I've done these things. And he was, of course, a very wealthy man. So all the trials began and he shared his wealth properly. 
He did this out of reverence and fear of God. It's possible that some Christians may be called to adopt children or to give help to orphans and needy children around the world in financial support. Of course, another vital way to care for the fatherless is through prayer. Whenever you hear of a, a minister or missionary, the gospel has been martyred or died in some way, make it a practice to immediately pray for his wife and any children he might have had. And one important application for us in all of this is we're to pray and depend on God in our lives. Even if we have good employment and assets in our lives, we all know how fragile those things can be. We need to pray for our daily bread, as Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer, expressing our regular dependence upon God. Our family prayers are really a model for our children. And Philip Ryken stated, a family that prays together learns God's providence together. I certainly saw that in my upbringing. Certainly the widow and her children did as well. Also an interesting point that we could think about is the relationship of Elijah and Elisha to the relationship of John the Baptist and Jesus. The great Scottish minister William Still suggested this parallel. In the New Testament, John the Baptist is described as the Elijah who is to come operating in that same spirit and manner. Uh, that would make, a lot, make Elisha then somewhat of a parallel to Jesus in the relationship. In fact, many of the miracles in Elisha's life are kind of similar to Christ, can point to greater miracles in the work of Jesus. In the parable with Elisha, the story of the miracle with the widow and the jars of the oil does point to an aspect of Jesus' ministry. It's not simply about God's providence of providing for this widow and her children. It's also a story of redemption. The danger that the widow's sons faced was not starvation, but slavery. Through the miracle, they were delivered from that. And one of the great promises in the Old Testament is that the Messiah will liberate captives. And look at Luke chapter 4. Which is right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And Jesus is in his hometown, region in Nazareth. And starting in verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the men would take turns reading. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And they all spoke well with him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. There's a change then, and they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. And he gets stronger, but in truth I tell you, there are many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath, to the land of Sidon, to the, widow, to the woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian, talking about Gentiles. 
when they heard these things, all the synagogue were filled with wrath and they wanted to kill him. They wanted to drive him out, throw him over a cliff. But notice the passage to set at liberty those who are captive. He's quoting from the Isaiah 61, particularly the first three verses. And Jesus mentioned the idea in John chapter 8 of slavery to sin. And look at John 8. It's a passage where he ends up telling them that they're doing the deeds of their father, the devil. Very popular words. From verses 31 to 35, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are the offspring of Abraham that have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it you can say you will become free? Amazing statement. There might have been a, a Roman soldier just a block away. <laughs> They're in occupied territory. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever, the son remains forever. Not just talking about general slavery and captivity, but talking about slavery to sin. And the worst slavery at all, of all is slavery to sin, and apart from Christ, Every lost person is a slave to sin. There are many examples we could give of this reality. Oscar Wilde wrote, put it in his words exactly, he said, The gods had given me almost everything. But I let myself be lured into long spells of senseless, sensual ease. Tired of being on the heights, I deliberately went to the depths and searched for new sensation. What the paradox was to me in the sphere of thought, perversity became to me in the sphere of passion. I grew careless of the lives of others. I took pleasure where it pleased me and passed on. I forgot that every little action of the common day makes or unmakes character, and that therefore what one has done in the secret chamber, one has some day to cry aloud from the housetop. I ceased to be lord over myself, like the other was. I was no longer the captain of my soul and did not know it. I allowed pleasure to dominate me. I ended in horrible disgrace. Pretty telling aspect of that. Uh, unusual, some woman would either be aware of it. James Boyce illustrated sin being slavery. In commenting that sin is slather, he writes, The difficulty here is that sin is rarely seen by us in this way. That is, in its true colors. Instead of being presented as slathery, it's usually described as the very essence of freedom. This is what the devil told Eve in the Garden of Eden when he argued, Don't be bound by God's word, be free. Eat of the tree and become like God, knowing good and evil. Years ago, some Christians in Hong Kong had an interview with an 82-year-old woman who had come out of China just a short while before. She was a believer in Christ, but her vocabulary was filled with the terminology of communism, which was all she'd been hearing for decades. One of their favorite expressions was the liberation. The interviewers asked her, when you were back in China, were you free to gather with other Christians to worship? Oh no, she answered. Since the liberation, no one was permitted to gather for Christian services. But surely you were able to gather in small groups to discuss the Christian faith, they continued. No, she said, we were not. Since the liberation, all such meetings were forbidden. Were you free to read your Bible? Since the liberation, no one is free to read the Bible. The conversation shows that freedom is not the word, but in the reality. Remember that the next time someone suggests that you have to sin to be free. Merely attaching the word freedom to sin does not make 
sin a way of liberation. The truth is that sin is bondage. Jesus said he would bring real freedom, not just a freedom from earthly slavery, but a freedom from sin. We also have a freedom from the fear of death, since we know we have the glorious eternity promised to those in Christ, promised by a faithful God. And do you believe in Jesus as your Savior? You trust in Christ alone for our salvation. If so, these promises are yours. And if you're not in Christ, you are still a slave to sin. And the command of Scripture is to throw yourself upon Jesus, trust in Him and His death and resurrection alone for His salvation, for your salvation. Jonathan Edwards said it this way, Christ not only delivers some fears of hell and of wrath, but He gives hopes of heaven and the enjoyment of God's love. He delivers some inward tumults and inward pain, and from the guilt of conscience, which is as a worm gnawing within, and He gives delight and inward glory. God supernaturally provided for the widow the Old Testament, delivered her from slavery. When we trust in Jesus, we are delivered from a far greater slavery, the slavery to sin. Let's pray. Father, we are, are grateful for the deliverance you have worked in our lives. That we are not slaves to the various passions and issues of, of sin. And while we still struggle and still fall, we know that we are ultimately kept by you. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit changing us, convicting us of sin, making us even aware of it at times, bringing to bear the instruction of your word into our lives. We thank you for the, the hope that we have as your people, the sure expectations that are set before us in your word not only of the immediate going to heaven and our death, but also beyond that, the future resurrection, the new heavens, the new earth. Thank you for those promises and that sure reality that is ours when we are in Christ. In Jesus' name.